Like I said, um, feel free to interrupt me any time, um, especially if I use some words that you're not sure what it means. I'm going to start with talking about cancer before I even start. I'm going to ask you guys, um, how many of you guys would believe that you would be able to get in here next year or the year after whenever you apply cancer? If you believe you will. Alright, now, then how many of you guys believe in cancer research and slogan that we will be cancer at some point? Alright. Okay, so either you guys have a very pessimistic view on your own chances, you have a very optimistic view on life about how, how we're going to cure cancer. And I guess cancer research really shares the optimism in that. That's why they change the slogan to now actually we'll, cure, we'll beat cancer soon. So they're very confident of beating cancer at some point. Um, and, you know, really, to go into cancer, what, um, how, how it arises is back in about 500 BC, so a long, long time ago in the ancient Greek times, this was first described back then. And basically, Hippocrates back then saw that he took out a tumor and he noticed that it looked sort of like a crab shape in, in the way it expanded in place. And hence, the Greek term for crab is cancer, and that's how cancer gets its name. Um, and you guys might know this that cancer is like a progressive disease, right? In other words, it accumulates DNA damage over time, which is why over the, the older you get, the more DNA damage you have, and therefore the more likely it is you get cancer. Um, and I'm going to ask you then maybe another question then. Um, how, how likely do you, do you guys think it's very easy to get cancer or very common to get cancer? And you're not all nodding. And then you're right, because um, one in three people in the UK now dies of cancer. Right? But if you look at it from a biological point of view, right, it's actually an incredibly, incredibly rare disease. And the reason for that is because if you think about it, in your bodies, you have about 100 trillion cells in your body. All of these cells are uh, being you know, damaged all the time by UV light, by smoke, by chemicals, by your body's own natural replication process that you just heard Alex talk about. Um, and all of these things lead to mutations. And really, only one of these cells in 100 trillion cells become cancerous. So if you think about the chances of that, you've got a lot higher chance of winning the lottery about a thousand times jackpot uh, than you have of one of getting cancer. So biologically speaking, it is an incredibly, incredibly great disease. And the reason it's so rare is because the body has a defense mechanism against cancers. In other words, there's all sorts of ways in the cells that prevents cancers from appearing, or from arising. And um, in terms of how easy it is to cure cancer cells, you guys probably would have heard about radiotherapy and all these different types of therapies that, that exist. Um, but the truth is, cancer cells are actually a lot easier to kill than that. Right? Because they're just cells. And that means you can maybe just throw out some sulfuric acid, for example, and that'll kill the cells. And if that doesn't do it, then the nuclear bomb certainly will kill the cancer cells. And there's all sorts of ways you can kill cancer cells. It's not that hard. Now, what makes it hard is then the problem that how do you kill the cancer cells without killing your normal body cells? In other words, how do you kill cancers but without killing the patient first? And that's really the key question in terms of cancer research. And to do that, we need to understand a bit more about the biology of cancer. So let, let me give you a, a, a scenario on how a cell usually grows, right? So um, you guys may have come across some of these things in your classes so far in school. But this sort of represents, uh, let's say, a, uh, that's it. Um, a cell. Um, and you can see the phospholipid bilayer on the top here. Um, and basically, inside your cells, you have receptors on these uh, membranes, and they send signals from the exterior of the cell, telling it to grow. And that then feeds into what we call a uh, signal cascade, or, or signal transduction network, where it follows through different proteins that perform different functions, eventually leading to some sort of a transcription factor, um, maybe downstream, that is able to basically carry out um, the, the regulation of what genes and what protein gets expressed, in other words, what protein gets made in the cells. And um, in cancers, you'll see that there are some stars going on here, and that's sort of to represent that some of these proteins are mutated in cancers. And when they're mutated in cancers, they become more active, right? All there's more of them. And as a result, your cells are now going to be growing more and more. And all of these um, proteins associated along this pathway, you can consider as oncogenes. These are proteins that are involved in cell growth, and the cancer that are hyperactive, therefore making it oncogenic, and oncogene being uh, cancer, and so on. Um, and in terms of 
how you would then treat cancers, what we do in terms of chemotherapy, is to find a drug that is specific against one of these mutated proteins, for example, let's say it's BRAF. So what you do is you effectively take out this protein using a drug. You, then, you may know there's a problem, and this comes from a biological problem, in that there are multiple pathways that may perform similar functions. Right, so if you did inhibit one of these proteins that involve the cancer, what might very likely happen is that the signal transduction cascade now funnels through a different pathway. For example, it might now funnel through this CRAF pathway, which performs a very similar role, and then it'll go down and do the same thing. And that's what we call compensation. And that's actually how you get resistance. So I don't know where you guys came from, but did anyone maybe come from London today? Great. You, you my friend. Um, how did you get here? Uh, I go through. You got driven. Driven, right. What do you what road do you take? Uh M, &M? Yeah. Right, okay. M, &M is another way that comes from London to Cambridge. Yeah. You can think of signals transduction a bit like roads um, roads if you like. So had M, &M been blocked by a drug, let's say, what would you have done? Take a different route. Exactly, you take a different route. So very it's exactly like South Sigling, you use an alternative route to get to the same end product. So in other words, this is how resistance comes about. In cancer, or relapse, if you heard of patient relapse, where you use initial drug and it kills 99% you know, of the human cells, and the one, one or two cells that survive are now not sensitive to the drug anymore because they've evolved a mechanism by which they can bypass this inhibition. And therefore, you get a new tumor coming back down, and now not only does your drug not work, um, but it's also often more aggressive as well. And so you can, you know, even if you've blocked both of these, there's other pathways that you could use uh, to, to bypass the signal. And not only this, signal is very complicated, uh, it's actually much more like this. So there's, a, there's a lot of proteins in the cell that, that can perform some functions. So like I said, that's the second problem of cancer research, is you get the resistance of tumors. If you think about this problem in this sense, what we really might want to do is to block something that is fundamental to so going back to another example, perhaps something more fundamental to you know your, your motorway traffic is if say for example you took out M25, right? Now it might be a lot harder for you to get out of London because it doesn't matter where you have to go from London, you probably have to go on to M25 at some stage. So in terms of cell signaling, what we want to look for is perhaps something that is what we call a node. Right? In other words, a, a protein, or in this case maybe a transcription factor, so one of these proteins that regulates it expression of different proteins, and we want to find something that is known, in other words, something fundamental to the cell that becomes very hard for resistance to develop if you actually inhibit it. And you can see from this diagram, it sort of shows you that Nick has these different ways of being activated by these upstream signal um, networks, and downstream it does a whole range of cellular responses, right? and so these are things from cell cycle, in order to cell division and so on. It regulates metabolism because if you have a tumor cell, you need to actually, if it wants to grow, you need to actually feed yourself a lot by taking a lot more glucose, using all these nutrients around. And, and you know, it plays a role in various other things. Some of these are more tech and more scientific jargon, if you like, like angiogenesis, which is basically the production of blood vessels. So basically, Nick promotes all of these things, all of these things which are associated with cancer. Now, what would happen if you inhibit Nick uh, is the question you don't want to ask. And given that we can't do a lot of these experiments in human patients directly, uh, in our lab we work with um, model organism and we use the mouse as an organism. And what we do is you have mice, and um, basically this is a lung tumor from a mice. And what you see here in the bottom left is a normal lung, what it looks like, staining for the HNE staining, but you don't have to worry about that so much. And we can actually induce the formation of tumors in these mice by activating some other organisms. And then you get these purple patches for them. These purple patches are basically tumors. Um, and as associated with the tumor, you see there's a lot more proliferation of cells, proliferation being basically cell division and growth. Um, now, what would happen if you inhibit to make this central node that was referring to that? And what you see is if you do that, um, you know, the lung of the mice reverts back to something much more resembling of a normal lung. And that's not unexpected um, because given how important MIC is to cells. But if you 
kept up with me so far, you might notice a problem, and that is, MIC is this protein used by not only cancer cells, but by also normal cells in order to do all sorts of functions. So you might suspect this might be very damaging to the normal cells, right? So we go back to the specificity problem. So we, we wonder what it would look like you know, in, the, in terms of normal tissues or healthy organs. Let's take the intestine, for example. Uh, you normally you have these uh, intestinal villi, which uh, you know have all the absorptive functions. Um, now, when you have a mix, you see that they don't look as normal, quite as normal. Right? So, um, and the reason for that is because the stem cell population, so these are the cells that go on to make these villi cells, they stop dividing because you inhibit inhibited mix, not only to cancer cells, but also to these cells. Right? So, as a result, the intestine, for example, don't look that healthy. But quite importantly, the actual function of the intestine remains intact. And if you then relax the treatment of this inhibition, you see that the intestine within days um, go back to what looks normal. And so that means we then, in theory, have a therapeutic window where maybe we can treat the mice um, with this mic inhibitor and hopefully kill a lot of the tumor cells and sure, you get a bit of a um, uh, deleterious effect to your normal uh, organs, but they can be reversed. Um, and that means you can treat the mice, but then you can then relax the treatment and it will go back to complete normal. And if you do something like that, you will see something like this. And like this is a survival case. In other words, if you just have untreated mice, so there's no treatment, uh, all the mice will then die. That's what the black line represents. And within about 35 weeks, but that's mouse here. Um, and um, if you treated this, these mice with a inhibitor, you see this boomer. And in other words, you see about 30% of the mice now surviving without uh, surviving and basically living to old age without getting cancers. Now, you could reason that's pretty nice, 30% of survival, or you could look at it and be like, well, there is still about 70% of mice that die. So you haven't quite cured cancer. So then we thought, well, Right. Given that it's reversible, the effects of normal cells, what we want to do then is to, what would happen if we treated the mice with a mic inhibitor for a bit, relax the treatment so the normal cells come back to normal, then treat it again, right, and so on, and again and again. And what we see then when we do this is we see that every single mice now survives. Right? In other words, mice never die of uh, cancers, and that's, that's a pretty a phenomenal graph in terms of cancer is rarely if you ever see something that gives you 100 percent survival from the treatment. Um, so effectively you've avoided the problem of specificity that I described to you because you found a window of opportunity where you can kill the cancer cells without actually making it too detrimental to the normal cells. And also given that make it so important to the cell function, it's very difficult for cells to evolve resistance against the inhibition of them. In other words, therefore, you don't have the relapse, which is why you get you know, complete survival of this. Um, now, does that mean we cure cancer? Uh, unfortunately, I'm going to have to leave you with a more sad note, and that is no, we haven't. Um, and the reason for that is because I've used this term, make inhibitor, to you right now. Really, how we've been able to inhibit this protein, MIC, which is shown in this diagram here, um, in this red protein here, you may recognize that as an alpha helix if you learn a little bit about uh, secondary structures of proteins. Um, basically, it binds the DNA um, using, using the alpha helix. And it also binds to its partner protein, max. And when they're bound together, they're able to the function. Now, the way we even have it to make is to use a genetic <coughs> approach, which means we artificially put in a gene that blocks make function. Right? And that, unfortunately, is not doable right now in terms of clinical uh, science in terms of actual patient trials if we don't do gene therapy. So instead we have to resort to chemical ways of inhibiting it. And that means we really have to start understanding more the chemistry or the biochemistry if you like that. And that means we have to start understanding how Nick and Max, for example, bind to each other. And if we can maybe design a small molecule, perhaps as a here, um, that will actually prevent Nick from binding to Max. And that might then disrupt the main function and so on. In other words, can we design a drug that will actually mimic what we do genetically? And that is a, that is a big challenge 
as, um, as I'm sure um, anyone who does protein structure would tell you, and but perhaps you know what Alex told you about using these uh, synthesized um, XNAs or perhaps other methods in the future, we might well be able to come up with something that can block the function. And um, what we know of that is because we show actually by inhibiting MIC, not only does it work so well for lung tumors, like I showed you, we show now it works in breast tumors, in prostate cancers, in pancreatic cancers, in all the cancers. And the simple reason for that is because MIC is so fundamental to all the cells. So, in some ways, our, our, our hope one day is you basically just walk into a clinic or you walk into a GP and you just have to say you've got cancer and you basically get taken help or something, and now we can get more cancers. And that would be something quite, uh, quite amazing. But will that happen? Um, that's something that we, we, we won't know. And you guys are interested in science. And that's exactly what science is about. Okay? Um, it's, it's got that frustration part where you don't know what's going to happen, but hopefully that's also the most exciting part because you don't know what's going to happen. And if that's something that excites you, solving these um, unknowns in life, then you know science might well be the way forward for you. Um, I'd have to thank everyone who works with me in the lab, and those are of course the funders. But before I finish, I'm going to ask you guys one more question, and that is. Um, None of you raised your hands earlier when, when I asked whether you would get in here, but a lot of you raised your hands for where the cancer would be cured. And that doesn't make sense to me because um, basically like, all of you, nearly all of you, are willing to battle something that you have no control of, right, and believe in that, but you're not, you're not able to believe that something you have full control of, right, when you apply here, and you don't, you don't believe in that as much. And I just want to say, you know, um, the fact that you guys are here, I'm sure part of you believe that you are able or good enough to be here. I would rather help you be sitting here today. And just keep believing in that. And, um, and whether you get into Cambridge or not, right, um, it doesn't matter what you do, just keep doing what you believe in and keep, keep, just keep pushing. And you never know what you come out of it. And um, on that note, I will say thank you. And that's my email if you ever want.